Thanks for coming. Um, as there is no formal uh, manager of the sequence of talks, I will take the opportunity to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a kind of opening window on SDN effort inside the government and in that the Department of Defense. And the reason is that Open Daylight is getting a mature technology very fast being deployed. And, and usually the government is a little bit late in coming to uh, the technologies. By the nature of things, there are so many things which are already on the ground and installed, uh, and it is working that you want to wait a little until things are mature before you want to integrate with your existing system. So uh, I thought this is a good opportunity for me to come here and learn what is going on. And in the morning's keynote, uh, it was very exciting to see that it is being used in a very big way. And big name players are there, and things are getting more and more uh, capability-wise, richer and richer. So before uh, going further, let me tell you about uh, myself. I work in Army Research Lab. Many of you may already know, but still let me repeat. Uh, the three services, Army, and Navy, and Air Force, they have the research labs. These are like corporate research labs, and they focus on problems which are of relevance to the services, Army or Navy or Air Force. And as you can imagine, the problems can span all over the knowledge world. It can go from pure mathematics to pure physics to applied physics to engineering to IT and so on. So basically, most of the engineering and pure sciences and applied sciences, they are covered. Coming back to the Army Research Lab, it is a lab based in Maryland. And also, it has its satellite campuses all over the country. And it is uh, about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 PhDs working on PhD and masters uh, and engineers working on problems at the cutting edge. Most of the work done is like universities. It is published. We go to conferences, exchange ideas. A small portion is so-called classified secret, which is not released. You can understand. Those are also part of our job. Uh, but majority, say 90 to 95% work is in the open. It is in the journals. And we really talk to industry researchers, academic researchers. We have. Uh, arrangements with a lot of universities. And basically, you can uh, understand the lab as being a good research university uh, without uh, the researchers having any teaching responsibility. So we don't teach, but we do a lot of research work. So okay. So uh, the, the outline is. Uh, here, I feel that I will be kind of preaching to the converted, because everyone knows what SDN is. And uh, maybe some of you know quite a lot more than I know. Uh, but when I prepared these slides, I wanted to put forward uh, my understanding of what SDN is and where will it fit inside DOD. So the first thing is that I want to describe to you what the DOD networks currently have, their salient features. And uh, then you can look at itself, like where are the things which need to be improved with the use of SDN approach. So that is the second part. Uh, then I will just put forth some slides on what the SDN paradigm I mean by. And uh, then the, what is the long-term vision? And this, these are kind of uh, uh, descriptive slides. And uh, I will describe a few uh, current SDN initiatives which we have, a couple of them inside Army Research Lab, and uh, some in uh, other service lab labs. And then future vision. 
So, in one word, if I want to describe the current DOD networks, the word is heterogeneity. It is extremely heterogeneous network in multidimensional sense. It is heterogeneous in technology modes, channel types, technology generations, and you can understand why. If you just go a little bit back in history, you know that the internet was basically invented by DARPA in the form of ARPANET. Uh, that is uh, when uh, it was a DARPA program, and people who don't know DARPA, it's a Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. It is uh, the future-facing research arm of the Department of Defense. And they, uh, in the 80s, uh, they had this program called uh, ARPANET, and that is the progenitor of the current internet. That is where everything goes back to. So you can see that the DOD networks have basically every component ever invented, and it is sitting there in someone, someone's um, office somewhere. And all of them have to work together. No one throws anything out. It is very expensive. And the Congress does not give us money, year after money, to really do the refresh all the time, because refresh is also expensive, quite expensive. And so our networks are heterogeneous. We have. Uh, components and the devices going back 10s and 15 years back and of course living with the current. Uh, some of uh, our agencies are uh, smart enough and uh, resourceful enough to really uh, also purchase the latest and the greatest as well. So all of this have to be there together and work nicely. Uh, especially in, uh, I have uh, not uh, noti noticed one thing and that is we also, uh, in uh, contrast to the private sector, we also have to deal with satcoms and the space components. So satellite communication is there, and uh, space component services don't deal with it. Uh, NASA is there, uh, but uh, in the wider world, uh, that also should be considered as a part of uh, the networks. Then again, the same heterogeneity continues in software and services. We have everything there, packet-oriented, circuit-oriented, voice, video, images, everything. Uh, transactions can be very short, just like the, and here I don't think we are that different from uh, the current uh, existing networks, the AT&T AT &T or the Verizon networks. They also have these, uh, this special kind of uh, uh, heterogeneity is like uh, uh, transaction sizes and transfer rates. And even services, if you have a telecom network uh, these days, uh, even though we have the, uh, everything is packetized and IP, uh, but still some portion still is the old TDM circuit oriented there. And quality of service, uh, again, uh, we have, uh, if you are at the commander level, say generals, they want almost zero error in the transmission of messages. Otherwise, it will be very dangerous. And if you are uh, down in the dungeon, uh, and we can live with some errors, and maybe sometimes a lot of errors. Because depending on the network connection in the field, it can be so, uh, say, patchy, uh, so much a little going on there that the error is uh, almost unavoidable. And the network management systems, uh, here, I should also explain this uh, question of um, the administrative domains which we have. Our administrative domains are more than AS. So AS is, of course, uh, one island of uh, connected uh, devices and the nodes and links which has one uh, kind of technology or the one kind of, uh, say, overarching uh, operator who declares, so this is my domain. And then you have another domain, say Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, and they, they have to talk together. Here, our domains are uh, at various levels. So not only we have these technology and IP-like domains, but we have these domains. So this is Army's domain. This is Navy's domain and Air Force. Even though we are all part of the bigger government, but if you dig down, a lot of, uh, let's say, rivalry and 
We don't want really to share. Army does not want to expose everything to Navy and vice versa and so on. All kind of things are there. And it is historical and sometimes it is, uh, uh, it, it makes sense also sometimes. Because you don't want, especially in the security, in this, for the sake of security, that everyone should know everything. So on the top of this kind of domain structure, we also have the so-called security domain structure. We have unclassified, we have FOUO uh, for official use only, controlled information, then secret, top secret, and then even above top secret, there are three or four other classifications which uh, are there. So you can see that, so the, the operating verge heterogeneity, this brings so much, uh, uh, say, complication to this DOD network that now you have to think, how can SDN help us? So again, this I already talked about. And I should also touch that there is another thing. We also have this coalition. We also work with our partners in uh, treaty obligations. So ANZUS treaties, Australia, New Zealand, and United States. Then Canada and UK, they are all English-speaking countries, which are tightly tight in many kind of obligations. And most of the time in the international arena, they work together, depending on the tasks and international missions. But so many times this is standing, especially this coalition is a continuing existence. So we always have US and UK talking together on various things of interest, for example and the Canada, and so on. And then uh, sometimes uh, we have to go beyond that, like NATO, and NATO has European Union. And despite Brexit and this and that, those relationships stand. They are not uh, abrogated. So the problem is that when you look at all this heterogeneity and try, try to understand uh, um, in, in, a, so in a very general manner, you can see that they are all uh, can be described as having many kind of interfaces and gateways. And at the technology level, that is how we access all those different domains. And this uh, currently has this one of the well-known problems which SDN wants, wanted to solve. We don't have global view. Programmability, forget it. Uh, if something happens, we always have to send someone to fix things, which will take maybe, if you are lucky, maybe one day. If you are not, maybe one week. Who knows? And, uh, and this is the cyber security issues. Uh, this morning, I was uh, surprised, well, not surprised, actually, that not even once the three keynote speakers, they talked about security. That word was not even mentioned, security. Uh, but security is of such a prime importance to us, given the nature of DOD. Uh, security at the cyber level, security at the physical level, everywhere. And cyber security is so important that, as you know, the recently Cyber Command had been stood up. And we have, uh, it is gaining uh, traction and uh, Many, how many people know, know about the DISA? OK. So DISA is a Defense Information Systems Agency. And it is a basically, you can say that it is the Google, Amazon, and uh, at and and Comcast, all of them jumbled together in one agency for the government, for the DOD, Department of Defense. Uh, it runs uh, one of the largest networks in the world. It is a global network, global in the truly geographical sense, all the continents and everywhere, because uh, that follows from the fact that US is the sole superpower. So, and, and that is where our uh, critics and adversaries, they really criticize us, like you are really controlling the world. But that is the job it has been given in some sense US is called upon to solve problems all over the world. So it has to have a network presence all over the world. So that is the network DISA manages and operates. And uh, so 
cyber security is of paramount importance because most of our assets are in the part of the world that we have, I should not say enemies, but adversaries. Uh, because there is a distinction. Enemies really want to harm you. Adversaries sometimes uh, don't want to harm directly, but they are always looking at how to take advantage of you. So we have all those players outside, state adversaries and the non-state actors. And you know what I mean, th those players. So cybersecurity is a very important issue for us. And how do we operate? Uh, how do we implement security uh, from the bottom up, taking care of all this heterogeneity, that is a very, very challenging problem. And SDN uh, gives a paradigm where it may be possible. So we are kind of quite interested in that. So th this is the current state of, uh, DODIN stands for Department of Defense Information Network. Uh, there is a whole lot of acronyms inside DOD which is a little bit different from the outside world. <laughs> so even the DODIN, I, have, I was told that it has been changed to DODIC, and C stands for center or something. I'm not very sure. But this is the current word. Uh, people who have uh, earlier uh, memory, it used to be called GIG, Global Information Grid, earlier. The same, uh, similar entity. Now it is called DODIN and DODIC. So uh, here uh, we have, uh, here is a cartoon uh, picture of the current state of uh, Department of Defense Network. We have, uh, like every other big network, we have a core, an edge, and intermediate, uh, say, which had middlewares and all the other things. And, and this is based on the interfaces and gateways, as I mentioned earlier. Now I come to, uh, the next part of the presentation, which is the, my uh, take on SDN, and it is very simplistic. Uh, for the people here, uh, you know more, and uh, at, at every level there are more complications. So what I want to say is that uh, traditional network model is on the left-hand side, and the biggest problem there is it is opaque and not programmable, not flexible. So if you compare that traditional network model uh, then uh, and look at the, uh, say, computers. Computers in the early days were also like that, hardware bound and everything. Then uh, computers developed and became programmable and flexible. Similar kind of uh, revolution is going on networking. Networking after the programmability came uh, through SDN, uh, we are talking about this whole ecosystem of open delight where we have different components where you can program and you can make network do what you want to do sometimes in real time. So this is uh, what was lacking in tradition model and if you look at the SDN part, uh, it is a cartoon of the SDN network and the idea is like here is the controller centralized which gives us a lot of good uh, capabilities. And here is a Achilles heel. Because it is centralized, all our adversaries are looking at ways to compromise and attack and take control of it. So how to make network controller, SDN controller, cyber secure, that is one of the big challenges. At least uh, uh, in our mind, it seems like that problem, uh, uh, it, it, it has been solved because I know that right from the beginning, uh, the open flow and the controller communication is encrypted by TLS and all those things have been done. But still, uh, there are the new uh, surfaces of attack which have arisen and how to make network controller harden against them, that is one of the challenges. So again, the same idea uh, which I want to present that SDN I understand as basically three layers, and uh, infrastructure, control, and applications. And I know that uh, there is a lot more going on uh, in, uh, say, uh, when you look at this interface, how do you, uh, how does the SDN controller talk to these applications? Uh, there are a lot of these uh, uh, RESTCONF and, uh, say, MDSAL, and a lot, lot of new acronyms which I have just learned together, uh, they are operative. And uh, when you go to the southbound, then you have the network devices, 
And for the timing, open flow is sufficient. But I will also say that open flow uh, needs to be changing, and maybe people are already working on it in one sense, that uh, if you lo look at open flow different versions, say version 1.1 1, 1 .1 to 1.3, the protocol fields which is covering is increasing. In every new release, it tries to take care of lot many more new protocols. Uh, so the danger is like uh, as the new uh, and uh, protocols are being developed, uh, very soon uh, the open flow will have to decide. It, it may have to uh, just for this for uh, from performance point of view, it may not be able to take care of all the protocols. So then, what will happen? So open flow has to change, and the idea of protocol oblivious forwarding or protocol independent forwarding is a new one which many research institutions are working on uh, where uh, whichever new protocol comes open flow uh, headers can cope with that that is the idea and that may have to be uh, also thought of as being part of open daylight in the future uh, but open flow people are looking at it the research i know so long-term vision of DOD is like there are different domains and they have different domain controllers. Uh, now the other question which occurs is the, how do these uh, domain controllers talk to each other? That is the east-west communication of controllers. And uh, there uh, the problem is that we don't have a standard yet. It is being worked on, but east-west communication has not been standardized. Uh, in contrast to say not controller and the devices, which is open flow, open flow is standardized. So uh, east west is uh, one of the big worries, and and there the uh, another uh, problem which uh, people uh, may guess here, and it is the problem of uh, when there are more than one controllers controlling more than one domains. What is the best topology? Is it hierarchical? Okay, here there are five domain, five domain controllers. Uh, maybe uh, three of them are managed by one super SDN controller, two other super SDN controller, and over these two, there is a super, super SDN controller. There's a hierarchy. Or maybe all of those controllers, they can be at the same level. And there may be some way, some protocol, uh, which can manage uh, what each has to do. That is the peer-to-peer -peer control. So that is one of the questions which need to be solved. And uh, I don't know, open daylight, uh, I have to learn more about it, like how it does it, or whether it does not do it. I don't know. Maybe someone can tell me. So uh, this is, again, the vision uh, kind of thing, uh, which may change in light of new developments. But this is what we cur I currently think. Uh, and. Uh, so we have SDN capable core, and and as uh, again one more thing I should uh, point out, and it was already talked about in the keynotes today. Transport layer SDN. So until and unless uh, the SDN controller is also able to look and understand and program the analog layer, because optical uh, say. Uh, signals are analog signals. They are not, uh, ultimately you have these laser pulses which are carrying the data in the optical network. And these are rodents which uh, are managing that. Uh, they are kind of routers for the optical signals. So how does SDN reach goes all the way there in a seamless way, apart from layer two and layer three control, controlling the optical layer? Already the work uh, was, there was, uh, I think it was AT&T presentation where there was uh, like Telia and uh, AT&T and one more. They are working on this thing. And uh, so, so this kind of advance is necessary and we need that. Uh, I have uh, skipped here. Uh, there, there are two more layers where that has to be done. That is a satellite layer and uh, another one is so-called aerial layer. Uh, this is a layer very specific to Department of Defense Network. Aerial layer is, you can think of a lot of planes uh, which are kind of in the sky, 
and they are themselves are the routers. So between ground to the air layer, air layer itself is extension of the ground network. So that is another complication. How do you uh, manage to have uh, control through SDN kind of paradigm uh, from aerial to the ground layer? This does not show that, but I just want to add that to the complication. So, so basically what I'm telling you is how bad our situation is. So uh, this is an idea that telecommunications, uh, many people may know that SDN idea is in other language, in other way, it was already implemented in the telecommunication network before the IP, before the SDN came around. So telecommunication communication networks, they had their element management systems, and network management systems, which basically did similar things as SDN controller is supposed to do. Uh, but this was in the device, uh, this was uh, before the IP became dominant. So uh, there you can see we have this so-called EMS and NMS. So EMS is a vendor specific island of network elements. So we have uh, all the Ericsson, say, uh, element uh, device device elements in the network. They will have one element management system, and uh, say Alcatel Lucent has another island, and another element management system. They, they will be managed by a network management system, which will go higher management, which is called business management layer (BML). The say telecommunications uh, jargon. So it is a similar idea as we have SDN controller for the one domain, and then hierarchically controlled by super SDN controllers. So this was already uh, talked about and uh, well understood in the telecommunication world. So that idea we will be taking uh, and uh, we can uh, re-employ re, uh, uh, in this situation. So again, we have multiple domains. Each AS has its own controller. And they are either peers or hierarchical. That depends on the requirement and the topology and optimization metrics. What is the metric against which you want to optimize uh, this topology? Uh, and uh, there is one uh, very uh, good uh, approach called broker-assisted peer controller management. Uh, some research has been done on that in the University of California system, actually Davis campus. And we are looking very uh, seriously at that. So, so brokers are software modules uh, inside the SDN controllers. And uh, you have some metrics which they control and optimize. But, but these all are at the same uh, level. They are not controlled by other supercontrollers. So this tells you that, OK, the, all these domains can um, exchange data and do calculations based on what they want to optimize. And that metric may change, uh, that algorithm may change, uh, depending on what you need. So this is a very interesting, uh, exciting approach, which we are looking at from the such point of view, and how to have multi-domain uh, network, uh, SDN-controlled network, in light of this idea. So uh, now I will uh, talk about a few of the projects which we have, just to give you a flavor. Uh, inside Army Research Lab, we have a SDN uh, test bed, uh, which uh, was uh, stood up last year. And uh, we are very focused, because we are a research organization, so we have a small research network. It is internal. It is not a big network, but still it serves about 1,500 to 2,000 researchers. And uh, many times uh, their needs are, okay, they want to do some calculation, they want to do some networking experiment, and they want to take uh, control of those assets, say compute, network, and storage assets, do their work, and then release it. You know, the slicing concept. This is very well known in the uh, SDN world. So uh, we are uh, trying to implement that, and uh, we have come a long way, and uh, hopefully soon we should be, internally we will prove uh, this concept, that it will be useful. And then uh, this is uh, what we have. Uh, this does not give the most uh, recent picture. It's slightly dated. 
uh, but uh, we have one of the first Gini node inside Department of Defense. Army Research Lab uh, implemented that. And our uh, Gini node is a DGA, that is a DOD Gini authority. So if other Gini nodes come up later, we will be the authority for them. We will be the controller for them. Uh, only thing is like uh, not that, it is, uh, again, uh, because uh, earlier when I said that we are slightly behind the curve, in this case, we are maybe a little bit more behind the curve. We still don't have many implementation of Gini nodes or SDN kind of things in other branches of DOD. Uh, we are at this time consider ourselves the leaders, Army Research Lab. Navy is thinking of doing that, and Air Force is, they are also doing. Uh, but when that will happen, we will know. Uh, people know that Gini is an academic uh, effort. It in academia, this is kind of SDN kind of approach, nodes, uh, which uh, connects uh, almost uh, more than 40, 50 academic institutions in the country. And it is uh, very uh, effective in large scale, large science networks, say high energy physics, if you are doing research in the uh, Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, collecting the particle uh, data, in you know, particle physics data, or if you want to do genetic engineering and uh, all the genome data you want to analyze and collect, uh, that kind of very large scale, or astrophysical uh, data also. So uh, Gini is very well known in the academic world. But inside DOD, we want to uh, also implement this. We have these researchers, different kind of projects, and we want to be able to do slicing and all those things. So that is where we come from. Uh, there is uh, another area which uh, uh, I will just touch on, won't go into that much detail. You may, heard of, you may have heard of quantum networking, quantum cryptography, quantum communication. We are interested in that. And even though it is academically, uh, academic research area, we are also interested in that. And uh, uh, idea is like uh, the SDN, can it, can, can it be modified to control a network in which the physical layer devices are quantum devices? So that is the basic idea. Right now, our devices, which are, say, uh, user edge devices, they are classical devices. Here, classical and quantum, uh, I don't want to go to the physics layer of that, but quantum mechanics is very different because of uh, nature of reality, which tries to describe atomic and the photonic level. And uh, there, uh, the quantum devices, uh, you may have read a lot of it in New York Times and other articles that uh, quantum computers are going to be very important within the next 30, 40 years because they have the capability of uh, future spurt in capability where they can solve problems which just cannot be even touched by classical computers. So that is the vision, quantum computers. And when these quantum computers, many of them are connected, that will be quantum internet, quantum network. So this is uh, something touching on that. And how SDN can help, uh, how the OSI layers, all the seven layers of OSI, how can that be modified to accept the quantum data and connect the quantum network? So that is the research about. So another uh, similar, uh, not quantum, uh, but another SDN related project, project uh, which uh, is going on is inside Navy. And it is a naval battleship networks. And if you look at uh, on the right, right hand side picture, SAT, that is a satellite uh, data which is coming. So you can think of the ships are here in the ocean, many of them, and the satellites are, are in the sky. So it is the ships, you can think of the southbound, and satellites have their, the controllers are there, and how they communicate. So that is the idea here called Naval Battleship Network. It is a SATCOM based. 
and currently they are looking at how to use SDN for flow optimization. Wrap up, please, so oh. these guys are going to okay. Okay. When, so I'm I'm done. Someone should have told me. I'm sorry. I will be done very soon. Yes. Yeah, someone should have uh, looked at the watch. Okay. So this is one of the uh, Navy uh, programs. And finally, uh, there are this another idea is. OSD is uh, Department of Defense boss, Office of Secretary of Defense, basically, OSD. They are looking at the using SDX for DOD networks, where SDS is for everything, X stands for other things. And the final slide, uh, and that is the uh, idea is that we want to uh, look at the, how heterogeneous networking architecture can be helped by SDN. I explained earlier, looking at the transport layer and looking at the security in particular, uh, including the optical wireless setcom all uh, in one unified uh, manner. And finally, uh, this I did not touch on, but I will just say that cognitive networking is also very important. How the cognitive aspect machine learning uh, enters this SDN paradigm, that is one of the big uh, things for us. Thanks for listening. And if anyone has any question, yes. Oh no, Genie is a platform, uh, academic platform on which SDN has been implemented. So it is just enabler. So Genie is in academic world. We took it, we want to experiment with that design. That is <laughs> Okay. Has it been standardized by ONF? Okay. That is what I meant. Yeah, I'm, there are there is another called SDNI also there. So I'm aware of that, but not like that. Thanks.